right. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the session about abstractions without regret. Uh, I'm Thomas. I'm the Gravium project lead and founder. Uh, I've, doing, uh, I've been doing compiler optimization work since about 15 years now. And uh, this talk will be a little bit to give you a feeling for uh, what just-in-time compilers can do, what they cannot do, uh, what you should be careful about when using those. And um, generally, we'll be talking about uh, performance. So one of the things up front I think that's important to, to, to think about uh, when talking about performance is why do we even care about performance? And in what, what scenarios do we care about performance? Uh, there's, I think, two main components to this. Uh, one reason why you could care about performance is for better user experience. Uh, maybe you serve websites, you want faster response times. Uh, maybe you have a Spark uh, data science platform and you want your batch process to finish faster for your data scientists to work better. So, so that's one aspect of why you could care about performance. And uh, the second aspect uh, could be to lower infrastructure costs. Use less hardware for the same tasks. I think these are the main two components. And, uh, and specifically, nowadays, uh, cloud environments, uh, lower infrastructure costs means uh, like using less CPU cycles directly translates to dollars. So if you, are, um, if you are paying for Amazon Lambda, you're usually paying on, on the size of the instance that you will occupy. And if you can fit the same problem in half of the memory, you will have half of the costs. Additionally, uh, nowadays, uh, even the, the, the carbon footprint of data centers is becoming larger and larger globally. So in the future, this will be also something to, to I think, think about in terms of just reducing the overall uh, also environmental footprint of your computations. But I think this is one of the core rules about when we think about performance or, 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 or these type of things. It's like um, identifying exactly on which programs, which parts of the program I actually care about it, and which parts are kind of like, um, you don't care about performance, you wouldn't spend any manual time optimizing it. The, the second aspect with performance is you can think about it in, in various different dimensions. Uh, I put here five main dimensions of performance on the slide. And uh, so you would have, uh, usually when people think about performance, they think about peak throughput. How many requests per second can I get? Or how fast can I uh, finish my batch process? But there are several other aspects that could be relevant for your application. One is uh, the startup speed. How fast can I start new instances of my application? Uh, one is the memory footprint. How much memory is occupied by my application? One is the max latency. Uh, maybe you care not so much about the common case, but uh, you care about uh, outlier cases and don't want to have a bad user experience in those scenarios. And uh, one other dimension could be the packaging size. I have to ship my application around. Maybe I have to ship my application to a mobile phone. And, and then in such scenarios, also the, the size that the op application occupies is, is important. And this is another aspect here. If you want to optimize a certain program or a certain architecture, for you, you have to think about which one of those dimensions is most important to you. Because there is trade-offs between those, and uh, usually you can configure the system and run them in ways where you would trade one against the other. Uh, most prominent maybe is, is for GM-based applications to trade peak throughput versus latency by selecting a different garbage collector. Uh, by selecting a garbage collector that, that runs concurrently, you might have less peak throughput, but you reduce your maximum latency, for example. So one of the common knowledge pieces about performance, I, I recently discovered in a Twitter conversation with Chris Newland, who wrote a book about Java performance and is a performance expert on, on JVMs. And he said, when my developers write hot code, meaning code that, is, code that is important for performance, it should look like it was written by my nine-year-old. No functional or advanced object orientation. And if I read this type of um, sentence, I, I feel, as a compiler constructor, I feel a little ashamed. Because, because as a compiler constructor, we actually should make sure that you can write highly abstract code and the compile and runtime system automatically takes care of the optimizations. 
And it's actually the case that often the more high level you state your program to the machine, the better the compiler and runtime system can optimize it in theory, if it's a good compiler and good runtime system. And this is one of the vision pieces of GraalVM on, on a higher level is that when you write code that should run on GraalVM, you shouldn't have to care about not using a Lambda function or not using Streams API because it could be slower. And that's why we spend a lot of time in the project making sure that specifically those abstractions, when you use them, uh, come without the performance regret. So you can use them without that regret. And that's why uh, we started about eight years ago, we started uh, the Gravium research project. Uh, back then, we, we made like a forward-looking research paper, uh, one VM to rule them all. It's like fun to read it now, like after, after these years. And uh, we started off with having a system that should just execute any programming language efficiently. I will not go a lot about uh, Gravium specifically in this talk. Uh, there is other talks on the deep dive on Monday in a recording for people who are interested in kind of all aspects of Gravium. What we will discover in this talk a little bit is Gravium has two ways to run GVM-based applications. And I think most of you will care about GVM-based applications to run on Gravium. One is it can run those applications in a just-in-time compiled mode, just like you're used to from your Java applications. And it has a second way to run those GVM-based -like applications, which is the native image mode. In this second mode, you, it's a two-step pro pro process to run your program. One is to create a native image out of your program with the native image command. And the second, and this produces a binary uh, that is uh, directly executable without any JVM around anymore. And then you can run that binary. So these are the two major ways that you can select on Gravium when you uh, run your program. And uh, depending on the trade-offs you want to take on footprint startup and peak performance, one is a lot better than the other. Gravium has additional capabilities like running all these polyglot languages, etc. But, but as I mentioned, we will not cover this in this talk. It comes in two flavors. There's Community Edition, there's Enterprise Edition. Today, in the demos, I will mostly show off the performance of the Community Edition, uh, which is already, uh, in many scenarios, better than the performance of the current compilers in the Hotspot Virtual Machine. The Enterprise Edition adds additional performance on top of this uh, Community Edition. And it is for free, it is, but the enterprise, the community edition is like free for use. It's a, it's an open source project and the enterprise edition requires a license, but it's uh, free for use in the, on the Oracle cloud. Those two ways to run Gravium, the EOT Gravium and the JIT Gravium have different trade-offs at the moment. So when you run in JIT mode, either on Gravium or also on, on a stock open JDK, you will find that the current way we are running Java programs in JIT mode is optimizing very well for peak throughput. So after you run your application for some time, the performance will be really good. And it is optimized for reduced max latency, specifically if you select one of the low latency garbage collectors on Hotspot. So on Hotspot, you have, you have like, um, I think, three categories of garbage collectors currently available. One is the parallel garbage collector, this is the one with the highest peak throughput, uh, and, uh, but it also pro uh, doesn't provide uh, that grade of a max latency. Then you have the G1 garbage collector, which is kind of in the middle. It is, it is having slightly less peak throughput than, uh, than the parallel GC, but not much, but it reduces maximum latency. And then you have the uh, real concurrent garbage collectors like ZGC or Shenandoah, who, are, who have like larger peak throughput penalty, but give the best max latency. So this is when you run it in JIT mode, either on Gravium or on a stock open JDK. The EOT mode of Gravium is basically taking steps in the complete opposite direction in terms of trade-offs. It is providing a very great startup speed. So you can start up your Java application like a C application in 10 milliseconds, five milliseconds. It is providing a lower memory footprint, and it is providing a smaller and more convenient packaging mechanism because you don't need to uh, have an additional Java virtual machine packaged with your application.
one of the things about here, I'm, I'm often using the word compiler, and compiler can mean to mo different people different things. Uh, so let's talk about the compilation pipeline that your Java program goes through when you execute it. On a default OpenJDK, what happens is that first you use a compiler, which is the Java C compiler, to compile your Java source code to Java bytecodes. That's like the first step. And this is a build time step for you. Because Java, as opposed to JavaScript, is a language where you need to first have a build time compile step before you, before you interpret it. Then once the program is loaded on, on, on Hotspot OpenJDK, it is first interpreted. So at first, there is an interpreter of those bytecodes. That interpreter is gathering profiling feedback about your program. It is figuring out what your program does around uh, loops and types, etc. And this profiling feedback is then later fed into the just-in-time compiler phases. And in this talk, I will mostly focus here on the just-in-time compilers, which are the compilers that are that are converting the Java bytecodes to the machine code that finally runs on your computer. Those compilers take information from the previous step, from the interpreter, to create better machine code. They take information like the types that occurred on a certain call site, uh, the types that occurred on an instance of. They take information like whether a certain branch was executed or how often it was executed. So they can take advantage of knowing a little bit about the program because depending on the program's behavior, uh, one type of machine code might perform better than another. As an example, if I have a loop and the loop is executed very often, then it will be faster if you can vectorize the loop. If the loop is only executed two times anyway, then vectorizing the loop could make the code slower. There's many of these trade-offs and heuristics one of these JIT compilers has to take in order to try to get the best performance in the common scenarios. And on the JIT compiler side, we have in Hotspot two JIT compilers. There's a C1 JIT compiler and a C2 JIT compiler. The C1 JIT compiler is there to create machine code relatively fast, but it doesn't do all of the heavyweight optimizations. It is basically there to make sure that we're not running too long in the interpreter, because running an in interpreter is really expensive. It is about 50 times slower than running in a compiled mode. So the C1 JIT compiler is the first tier JIT compiler that would create the first set of machine code from the program. But then if parts of the program is really important, then it will also be then processed a second time by the C2 JIT compiler, which has more heavyweight optimizations in it and will produce slightly better machine code, usually about 20 to 40 percent better. And, and then the, the C1, once, once this happens, then the C1 JIT code will be replaced by the C2 JIT code. This is a standard OpenJDK when you run your Java program. When you run your Ch Java program with Qualium just-in-time mode, what will happen is that the last tier JIT compiler uh, will be instead of the C2 JIT compiler, it will be the Gravium JIT compiler. We have replaced here the last tier, final tier JIT compiler. The rest of the pipeline is exactly the same. And in the Gravium EOT mode, things are a little bit differently. Here we have no more JIT compilers involved because we do everything at build time, which has the advantage that you're not wasting any CPU cycles when you run the program later on. And uh, in this scenario, both the Java C compilation and the Gravium EOT compilation is happening at build time. So the final output of your build time step is no longer Java bytecodes and Java files. It is uh, just machine code. So, so these are the different, uh, different uh, type of, of compiler pipelines. One note maybe about the Gravium compiler, which, which, is, which I think is an important detail here, is that the Gravium compiler itself is written in Java. So, um, so we have actually a, a just-in-time compiler written in Java compiling other Java programs. In order to not suffer from startup time problems, in the Gravium JIT mode, what is happening is that this, this Gravium JIT compiler itself is ahead of time compiled and linked with the Hotspot virtual machine. 
But yeah, this, this having the compiler written in Java has several advantages. One is a security-related advantage, meaning if, like, in, in, in currently, if, if in one of the C, C++ compilers there is a bug, it will be bringing down the whole JVM with a sec fault. And in our Graal compiler, we get a nice null pointer exception and can, like, go back to one of the lower tiers. So, so it, it provides us a, a more memory-safe compiler. And the other important advantage of that for us is that the, the whole Gravium team is Java developers. And they, are, they know that if they optimize Java well, then their own program will run faster. <laughs> so uh, they, they kind of have an incentive and are daily confronted with Java idioms uh, that uh, they then also optimize. And this helps just in terms of like making sure that 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 um, that, that Gravium is good at optimizing general purpose Java code. All right, so let's uh, let's increase engagement here a little bit. Let's have a have a have a quiz here. So I have I have here three versions of a program. I've written a negate program. And um, and first, I just yeah, I, I negate uh, the value, uh, the parameter value. Uh, the second version of the program is yeah, it, it's like adding zero to the value and multiplying it by one, etc. And the third version of the program is, is the most beautiful one I feel like because this really uses the full power of of Java and abstractions. Um, so. So, so here, here we like you know create an object out of it and 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 make sure that this is really 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 nice, and uh, so. But then, but then a, a, se a senior developer comes along, right, and says, "Well, this this third version, this negate number three, this is this is really this is a performance problem because you're allocating so much here, right? We are, we are allocating so much stuff. Why don't we?" Well, well, actually, the first thing the senior developer says, you should use the yeah, var keyword because you are like a modern Java. But but the second thing is um, why don't we create the negate four version? It's it's the version four of the program because because this negate three it allocates so much. Let's just cache that allocation, right? Because obviously that that must be better for performance. And so then then we use a cached array and and we avoid that array allocation and just return the value. So now 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 the quiz for you guys is. Uh, which of those programs runs fastest, uh, uh, and and which runs slowest? Maybe let's do fastest first. Who thinks uh, negate number one executes fastest? All right, most people in the majority. Who thinks negate number two executes fastest? Very few people. Okay. Who thinks negate number three executes fastest? Two, two really brave people left. Okay. Uh, who thinks negate number four executes fastest? Okay, Oleg, Oleg, we need to talk afterwards. And so, um, who thinks negate number four executes faster than negate number three? All right, a couple of people. All right, excellent. Cool. Well, I mean, the truth is, in some sense, uh, you're all correct uh, because the answer, like the answer to many, many problems in this world, is it depends. Um, <laughs> So it depends on which pipeline are you using to execute the program. If you execute your program in the interpreter of Hotspot, which you can, by the, you can also test this yourself. It's, there's a flag called xint, which, which, which forces everything to be executed in the interpreter. So in the interpreter, it is true that negate number one will execute fastest. Because the interpreter will just generally um, like interpret those bytecodes and do no transformations and nothing, and and so therefore negate number one will be fastest. On this first tier compiler that I showed before, on the C1 compiler, C1 compiler does basic optimizations. It it is able to do the optimizations to make negate number two as fast as negate number one, because because what the, what we do in in these JIT compilers is we 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 more like simulate the program. So how many local variables you, you allocate doesn't matter. And we do basic transformations like x plus zero is x, etc. You might think like, why do we even need to do this optimization? Nobody's so stupid to write such code, right? Uh, but but the, the, the thing is that uh, such code patterns often occur after the compiler inlines a couple methods. And it's actually good programming practice to make helper methods and, and abstractions. And then after these helper methods 
uh, in line, the compiler might see patterns like x plus zero or something like that. They might see that much more often. So in C1, negate number one, number two will be executing uh, fastest. Negate number three will be on C1 slowest because it needs to allocate and it cannot remove the allocation because it is missing escape analysis, which is, which is a mechanism to remove allocations. On C1, the, the C1 compiler, negate number four will uh, run better than negate number three because you, you're not caching things. But on a, on a more sophisticated JIT compiler, and that includes here C2 and the GraalVM JIT compiler, what's happening is that also in the gate number three, you will have the same performance as in the gate number one. Because those JIT compilers are able to remove all those object allocations. And in general, uh, JIT compilers like local object allocations, because if you store a value somewhere locally, meaning in your local function or local object that you just allocated, it is proven that no other thread and no other, yeah, no other concurrently running thread can see that value. And this is a very nice property for the JIT compiler because, uh, because it usually looks at the method from the current thread's perspective. So if it's the case that another thread could see something about the value, it is forced to compute the value. But if another thread is, is proven to not be able to see that value, I can just simulate it. And in such a scenario, I, I'm able to, to run the negate 3 function in the same speed as the negate 1 function. And the fun part about this is here that in this sophisticated compiler, C2 and GraalVM JIT compiler, writing then an optimization of the negate 3 function and, 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 and write negate number 4, negate number 4 will be slower. Because suddenly, suddenly the value of this integer box is escaping into some array, and that static, array, that static field could be seen by other threads. So the compiler is forced to actually create that object. This is just a general like, warning a little bit of like uh, making sure that like not like a local a local allocation that does not escape is better than something that escapes. And I think there's many thousands, maybe millions of Java programs out there that do something about multiple return values, where they allocate some array and then return the array, but then cache the array. So don't do that. Uh, try to stay local with your allocations and, and try to, um, but, but don't worry too much about low level things like A plus zero or, or like really some, some of these optimizations that the compiler would do anyway. All right, so one, one more thing about performance is, and I have here uh, one of the performance graphs. In the GraalVM compiler team, whenever we do a check-in on the GraalVM compiler, we run like a hundred different programs or more to check the performance impact. The problem for us sometimes is that even for these programs, this is one of these benchmarks we are running. Uh, this is showing, I think, one month of time where every check-in is, 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 a, is a benchmark metric. And you see, well, the value is not that stable. So because of various factors, some in the hardware, some also in the software, uh, those results that you get from benchmarks and, and running things are usually not that stable. So whenever you see benchmark number published, etc., always look also for reproducibility of these benchmarks and error bars, etc. Otherwise, it's just a, an approximate number that is not necessarily very fine. And we as compiler constructors actually have a little bit of an issue here in the sense that if I have a benchmark like this, uh, and this is going up and down by about three, four, five percent. So if I now do an optimization, I have a hard time knowing whether I'm actually improving things or it was just luck. But over time, and this is now zoomed out over the last one and a half, two years of this benchmark, over time, the direction looks good for us, right? But, but it shows a little bit how we are like making a lot, a lot of small changes and only over a long period of time, then like it is suddenly making an impact that is very substantial. So um, like um, looking at a JIT compiler, getting more optimizations is like looking at like grass growing or something. You're like, what did I do last week? Nothing changed, right? But at some point it is, it is high. And, 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 and at some point you see the impact if you, if you take a larger scale. 
All right, let's uh, let's do a short demo here. Um, Um, so for my demo, one of the things as well here is on my laptop I have disabled the Turbo Boost. Uh, many Intel CPUs have a Turbo Boost and and uh, it means uh, it can change the clock rate and it, it it adds additional additional variability to the benchmark results. Uh, so this is one of the harder factors you actually can influence. So I disabled here the Turbo Boost. And so the first example that I want to show here just quickly, um, I will not go into super detail of that example, but one of the nice abstractions that the GDK offers is it offers a utility function, uh, objects.hash. I can show it here in the code as well. It's just, yeah, this is my compiler workspace because usually I'm just, um, there's a utility function in the GDK called objects.hash. By the way, who, who knows about this utility function? Oh, many people. Excellent. That's this is great. So, so it is it is a nice function that allows you to compute the hash value, uh, the the combined hash value of multiple individual values. It has here a variable arguments array, and in Java, this means that when you invoke that function, there's actually a reallocation. Because under the hood, it just means that this this function takes an object array. And then, and then this calls to arrays dot hash code, and arrays dot hash code is then iterating over this array and calling the hash code function on each of the elements, and computing a combined hash code. And I have here two versions of my code. One is here called objects hash raw, where I've manually done an optimization to not use that utility function. I've just manually put in this similar calculation. And here I'm using this utility function. I have it here copied just to make just to be better at the presentation here. And so what's happening if I'm now running this type of program in a in a so I'm running here on I'm running here in Java 8. Um, if I'm running this program here on a traditional um, Java 8, what's happening is that the abstracted version gets about 164 operations per microsecond, but the raw version is like substantially faster, like 580 ops per. So, so by using this nice utility function in GDK, you, you, you're losing like 4x performance. So we are not, like this is something that, that we as GraalVM JIT compiler constructors want to certainly not like fix, we want to fix it. Uh, we, we don't want this to happen, and uh, because we don't want people to avoid using these nice abstractions in the code, which would be better from a design perspective, uh, just to get a better performance. And what I can now do here, I can run the same thing on the GraalVM Community Edition. Um, and what is what is visible here is that the abstracted version and the raw version of the code. Both have a great performance. Both have a great operations per seconds. But here, actually, in this specific instance, the like that I was just running, the average score on abstracted was higher. But you always need to look at the error score, etc. So, but, but the, the the bottom line here is that um, when you use the GraalMC cheat compiler, it's the same performance. You might think, okay, let's let's use a more modern Java version. And for this here, I have um, Java 13. When I run Java 13 on this piece of code, um, I'm in a similar situation that the abstracted version will be a lot slower than the raw version. One item here, uh, so here we actually see that Java 13 is slightly slower in score. So you might think, why, why the hell, why is Java 13 slower than Java 8? That doesn't make any sense. Um, and one of the things here which is important is that on Java 13 they changed the default garbage collector, like actually they changed in Java 9, to be the G1 garbage collector, which is trading throughput versus latency. So when you compare here different Java versions, you might compare different garbage collectors actually, not just different Java versions in the terms of like different compiler versions. But, but it, it's approximately the same situation. So. Let me just quickly uh, go through like the optimizations the GraalVM Community Edition compiler does in order to get the better performance on this piece of code. So this is the hash function, and this is this is 
how we call it, right? So the first thing here, I have a different pseudo code of this code. Abstract uh, version two here is um, it's just a transliteration. This is how the code looks in Java bytecode. Uh, because you have variable length arguments, it's actually an object alloc allocation that is boxing the two values. The next version of the code here is uh, just inlining the hash function. We just inline that function. And after we inline that function, we can already see, even the IDE tells us after inlining, this is that code. Uh, because, because in the utility function, we had this null check on the array, so we can remove that dead code. We can just remove it. Then we get to the next version of the code. Um, then one of the transformations the compiler does here is we multiply by 31, but instead of doing that, we can multiply by 32 and subtract the value because that's faster on a modern Intel CPU. So the compiler will exchange this multiply by 31 by shift left to 5 minus the value. Next thing the compiler will do is we'll say, okay, this array has just length 2. I know it's... <coughs> Statically, this is length two. I'm iterating over this array, so I don't need an actual loop here. I can just unroll the loop, and it will take the loop body and copy it and copy it. So now we have the loop body unrolled in its elements. There is no more loop available. And then one of the optimizations the crowd is specifically good at is this object virtualization, where we avoid allocating an object. So the compiler now sees that this object that we allocated here is only used locally. It's only used temporarily to store some values, but then it never escapes the current execution. And in such a scenario, the compiler will remove the allocation and just replace it with the individual elements of that array. So we end up with abstracted number seven here. Uh, finally, we can now start inlining these hash code methods, the int hash code method and the double hash code method. So we inline those two methods again. And for the int hash code, we now remove the boxing because we don't need the boxing anymore because we just get the value out of the int field. Final optimization here is that, well, we have here our zero. So this is zero, shift, shift, left, five minus zero is just zero. This is another one that's tri almost trivial canonicalization the compiler will do. And this is uh, approximately the, the final version of that compiler graph, uh, it is a final version of that method that the compiler will then uh, convert into machine code. And in, in the compiler doesn't really, I, I showed you here just the code, uh, to because as a program I'm usually thinking about the code, the source code. Uh, the compiler thinks about it more in terms of a graph structure. So this is the final graph structure the compiler will then turn into machine code for this piece of program. And here we see, okay, it's reading two values, int value, double value, and it is doing some calculations here to create the hash code and then returning. But generally the compiler does many, many different transformations. Uh, like on the left here, we see different phases the compiler will do, where the compiler will try various transformations of the program uh, to try to make it uh, faster. Another scenario where this can be interesting, uh, of course, is well, we, we, we are doing very well on streams API type of abstractions, where we can optimize the streams API expression in the same way you would optimize that uh, manual loop. And another instance where escape analysis can be super interesting is for logging frameworks, where here I'm having a logging function and I'm logging um, two values and then I have a logging enabled meth uh, method that will, in most scenarios, return false. And uh, so in most scenarios, the, the values that are allocated and used here and computed here are actually not necessary. And therefore, we can remove some of the allocations again. So this is another scenario where, like, if we, if we run this on... Um, If you run this here on, on, on stock JDK, we get about a hundred, um, we get about a hundred, uh, 33, um, operations per second. And we can run it here in the Gravian community edition. And the, the score is much higher because we are able to remove some of these abstractions. In this case, it's 500 operations per second. You can also try here the Gravium Enterprise Edition. 
um, which uh, then provides a slightly higher score even than the community edition. But but there's like you know you can modify these benchmarks etc. It's just this is really just to show you a principle of how we are how we are optimizing some patterns that are common in Java programs, like the one where you allocate something and then use it only in one branch, but not another. All right, so I, sh I showed you micro benchmarks as a demo, uh, but we also have uh, like larger, longer measurements on, on larger programs. And in the end, we are recommending, of course, that you test your own program and your own workloads on, on a certain compiler or system. And uh, so, because, because in the end, it's, it's, it depends very much on, on, on your setup, how much of a gain you can get. This is just to give you a feeling of, of the range of gains that are possible. Uh, we have here the Renaissance Benchmark Suite, where we test various web frameworks. Some of them are Scala frameworks, like Finacle, uh, Load Balancer, uh, some are like uh, algorithms like PageRank. And what we see here is that, well, for some of the programs, Gravium Enterprise Edition is not giving that much speed up, maybe only a few percentages, but there is also programs where the speed up can up, be up to like 2x. And similar for the Gravium Community Edition has sometimes substantially better performance than the standard uh, OpenGDK distribution. So we we actually encourage people also, if you even if you think like, well, I will, I don't, I don't want to ever have a license for Gravium Enterprise Edition, uh, try out Gravium Community Edition because it can already give a, a potential performance benefits for your workloads, like it does currently for Twitter, for example. They are using the Community Edition to uh, run their pro Scala programs faster. We think uh, we want to receive more benchmarks, so we are interested in your own benchmark numbers uh, or like or your own workloads because we think that optimizing for too few benchmarks is like overfitting a machine learning algorithm. It is like we are, we are like trying to make sure these benchmarks run very well, but then you give it a different program and, and suddenly the compiler falls apart, right? We want to avoid this, uh, and this is why in the Gravium team we have many, many different benchmarks, like hundreds of different benchmarks. And uh, what of course happens is I do an optimization and I need to look at many, many different numbers and see how they interact with these hundred different workloads and hopefully show no regression or almost no regression on none and show substantial gains on others. We have here uh, this benchmark suite on resource.dev where we try to collect more industry benchmarks. So, so I talked now about uh, so the demo, etc. was about the Gravium JIT compiler, just the standard way how you can run your Java programs now with the Gravium JIT compiler. On the Gravium EOT compiler, the performance characteristics that you get are very different. And I have here an example where I'm using the Gravium EOT compiler on a Micronaut web service. And what I'm doing is that I'm serving three requests to that web ser service. So, so the web service is serving three requests. I'm starting it up and it serves three requests. And what I'm painting here is the CPU cycle usage and the memory consumption of that web service. What's happening is that, that in, the, in the case of EOT, the memory consumption is an order of magnitude lower, here only 35 megabytes compared to 145, and the CPU cycle consumption is also substantially lower because on the chip side of things, we need to um, spend a lot of GPU cycles for converting those bytecodes into machine code, and this is where you get all these spikes at the beginning here of the application during startup, but also later on there can be a spike when another part of the program gets hot. So this is why uh, the, these characteristics of both memory consumptions and CPU cycle occupancy of your, of your program are very different when you select the EOT mode compared to the cheat mode. Generally, like, um, like measuring CPU cycles instead of war clock time is better because it gives a lower variance in the face of potential uh, variance from the operating system because it will just measure the CPU cycles that is used by your process. So if your process would wait long on a certain network request, you wouldn't see it in the result, or at least not substantially in the result. One can use Java Flight Recorder to actually figure out um, uh, not just what your application does, but also what your compiler threads do. This is an example of a Java Flight Recorder program where 
during the whole program run, the JIT compilers are active, and which means that at the end, when the program is finished, you spend a lot of wasted time JIT compiling. That was actually not really useful because once the JIT compiler produced the machine code, the application already is finished, right? So in such a scenario, uh, ahead of time compilation or using a lower tier JIT compiler, making the JIT compiler faster with some flags can bring advantages. And in Java Flight Decoder, you can, uh, you can select the compiler threads and see how busy they were during the compilation runs, uh, during the application runs. Important when you talk about both the throughput here and also the RSS is that you have to be able to, um, to tune uh, the, your application, the main tuning points for native image for lower footprint is XMX for maximum memory and XMN, which is the new generation size, which is the part of the heap that is reserved for new objects. And you can play around with those two values. For typical web servers, you probably don't want to have such a high new generation size, maybe 16 megabytes, 32 megabytes is good enough. And, uh, and you also might want to constrain the maximum memory more. This is, these are the main parameters that will trade off throughput, peak throughput, against the um, memory consumption. And you can like search the space here uh, by trying various points to see the impact. Problem native EOT support is available in multiple frameworks. It's available in the Micronaut framework, in the Hadidon framework, and also in the Quarkus framework. We are working together with the Spring team at Pivotal to make it also available for Spring applications because we know uh, that many, many people care about using Gravium ahead of time for Spring applications. There are already experimental, as an experimental Spring feature that can run some of the native images and we're currently working with the Spring team to uh, make sure the performance is great and and that we can expand the current set of examples. If you want to hear more details on this specific aspect, uh, there is a session today uh, at uh, 3 p.m. Um, about uh, running Spring Boot applications as Gravium native images from Sebastian Deleuze from the Spring team. I recommend that uh, session and he will present as well performance number specific for Spring. But generally, the startup time is a game changer here, uh, which allows your application to scale up and down more quickly. It's a game changer for all of these frameworks. Uh, this is an important aspect as well, is like when some of these frameworks are are being vocal about their 10 millisecond startup time or 20 millisecond startup time, <laughs> the reason they can achieve that startup time is because they are using the Gravium native image capabilities. Why are we starting faster in EOT mode? Uh, why is it the case that we're starting faster? Well, obviously, no class loading. We don't need to load classes when the application starts. The hot code doesn't need to be interpreted first, and, and uh, interpretation is about 50x slower, as I mentioned earlier. There are no CPU cycles spent on gathering profiles uh, from the application, and also no CPU cycles spent on just-in-time compilation. Memory usage is a, it's a similar picture. It has substantially lower memory usage um, on, 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 this, on these frameworks, and again, the lower memory usage comes mainly from the Gravium native image usage. And why is the memory footprint lower in EOT mode? One is there is no metadata for the classes that are loaded. There is no profiling data uh, that, that has to be gathered during, during the startup, which occupies also memory. There are no just-in-time compiler data structures, and there is no dynamic code cache where the dynamically graded code from the just-in-time compiler would live. Those factors are all related to the size of the application in terms of the char file size or the amount of code that you execute. So this means that the memory footprint uh, advantages of DOT mode are larger if your application is large, meaning has much code, but it doesn't itself have so much payload. So because the application payload itself, the, the data structures the application caches, are the same size currently between the EOT mode and the JIT mode. Uh, and this is why the EOT mode only makes sense if your application has a smaller heap, meaning a heap uh, below a gigabyte or something. 
If you're in the, in the tens of gigabytes of heap, then you would use the Gravium cheat mode. In the Gravium team, we have a goal uh, to make uh, the cheat, the AOT mode better in peak throughput and reduce max latency. For this, we have various projects in the pipeline. One of them is a new garbage collector that is based on the G1 garbage collector. And we are fixing several performance issues in the runtime to get better peak throughput. One of the ways you will be able to e get even more better throughput and also more predictable performance is to uh, do profile guided optimizations offline where you are gathering profiles uh, before you run the application and before you are creating your final optimized binary and then you feed the profiles into that final generation. This allows you to get predictable performance because you can in your tests and the test workloads you gather the profiles with, you can stress exactly the cases that you care about most. All right, to summarize, some of the key takeaways I want, uh, for in terms of performance uh, and, and, and ways how to write more performant code. One actually is, I didn't mention it so much during the presentation, but write small methods. Uh, one reason for that is that compilers are good at inlining methods. They are currently not doing much outlining of methods. So when the compiler sees a very large method and a large part of it is actually not very hot, it's not executed very often, the compiler still has to inline everything. So writing helper methods, small methods, give the, give the compiler choices is a good thing. Um, local allocations are free and global data structures are expensive. So if you want to optimize your memory of your application, etc., focus on the global allocations. Because the local allocations are either completely free, because the compiler removes them completely, or they are at least uh, not very expensive because the garbage collector will, will, will be better at removing young objects than objects that are around for a long time. But if you have long living data structures, this is the place where the compiler cannot do much about it, where you as an application developer need to make sure that you're compressing those data structures. Don't hand optimize too much uh, unless you have studied the actual compiler graph. Uh, we rather want you to make a pull request to the Gravium project with your pattern that you're facing, uh, because if we can identify this pattern in a more general way, we might be able to create a new transformation that will benefit every instance of that same problem. I think it's it's I think we as a programming community should actually strive to help each other like make the compilers better, make those patterns better, so we don't have to do hand optimization or hand unrolling loops uh, ourselves in the code. For the best throughput, use the Gravium cheat mode. For the best startup and footprint, use the Gravium EOT mode uh, and native images. Gravium is an open source project. We have like uh, tons of lines of code on, on GitHub um, that we maintain for the Gravium community edition. And it has many, many different components. Uh, they are like in different state of production readiness. What is currently production ready 100% is Java, JVM based languages, uh, JavaScript, Node.js, native image, and also the visual VM tool that comes with Gravium. Using Gravium for any of these languages is 100% production ready at this point. Still experimental is the Ruby and R implementation and our LLVM implementation to execute other languages. And then we have a couple visionary projects in Gravium, including the Python implementation, Visual Studio Code plugin, GPU integration. There's a talk at this conference as well about this, where we collaborate with NVIDIA for GPU integration. WebAssembly support is in the works and an LLVM backend for native image. But, but Java workloads are 100% production ready and they're already making a difference in real workloads. The latest adopter of Gravium is the Oracle Cloud Infrastructure team, where we have migrated like, uh, like all of their services uh, now to Gravium Enterprise Edition for better throughput and lower garbage collection. Uh, what we saw in one of the core services, it's the OSCI telemetry service, is a 10% improvement in peak throughput, but also a 25% improvement in garbage collection times, because we could, we could remove more object allocations and therefore reduce the average time spent in the garbage collector. There is more platform support coming. Uh, JDK 11 support is coming for Gravium that is uh, scheduled uh, for 19.3, uh, mid of November. And you're working uh, on ARM64 and Windows support, as well as on support for the latest JDK uh, version. 
Well, so final thing here just is like, uh, please give us feedback on Gravium, download and use it for application. You can download the community edition. Uh, you can also download the enterprise edition and validate it for your workloads. Uh, and uh, and um, yeah, please let us know what you think about it. We're very active on GitHub, have a public Slack channel as well. Uh, and we are absolutely interested to engage with the community uh, on on making Gravium better and in the end making the Gravium vision a reality. And uh, with this, my time is up. Uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. Uh, thanks for coming and I'm available for questions and there's also socks available, there's the Gravium socks. Uh, if you, uh, they're really awesome I think. Uh, so if you come forward here, you will get a Gravium sock uh, and, uh, and also I'm able to answer your questions right now. Thank you very much.